Hello, good morning. I am Dr. Cortina from University of Illinois in Chicago. And um, today we are going to talk about corneal grafting in infectious diseases. So we're uh, going to get started. And I have no financial disclosures to make on this topic. So why are we talking about grafting in infectious diseases? Well, if you think about it and look at the epidemiology, about 20% of corneal transplants done worldwide are actually for infectious keratitis. And of course, the indication for corneal transplantation varies according to uh, uh, the regions in the world. So 24% of all countries in the world, actually the primary indication for transplantation is infectious keratitis. There are more potent antibiotic agents right now available, so the incidence of transplantation to control bacterial infections is decreasing. However, for fungal ulcers, uh, surgical, uh, surgical treatment is still a large uh, part uh, of the management of these conditions. So how does corneal transplantation work by in infectious keratitis? Well, when we're talking about a bacterial infection, more often than not, we might be able to completely remove the infected tissue by performing corneal transplant. However, in cases of fungal or acanthamoeba infections, removing the entire infected area may not always be possible, but debulking the infection might allow to uh, antimicrobials to eradicate the residual infection in the host. So, uh, who is a candidate for a corneal transplantation? How do we select patients or how do we, how do we indicate a therapeutic keratoplasty? Well, number one is uh, preservation of the globe. Uh, so if we have a patient that has a perforation, then that's a no-brainer, need, that needs to be closed, he needs a transplant. Or maybe he may have an impending perforation and we actually wanna get in there before you know, things get more tricky because it's always trickier to do a transplantation on a patient that's already perforated. When we're starting to suspect extracorneal extensions, so that's, um, that's an indication that the infection is really not under control and we need to do something uh, to try to stop it. Uh, if we're thinking that there is some intracamel extension or endophthalmitis, um, that might be an indication or impending scleral extension, because once it gets into the sclera, that's really difficult you know, to remove surgically. Uh, that's on the acute phase when we're trying to control the infection. But the other indication would be an optical graft for visual rehabilitation after the infection is controlled. And as you will see later on when we discuss all the, the evidence and, uh, and the published studies, of course, outcomes of optical grafts are much better than those done with a hot eye. So successful medical therapy is always better. So we're not gonna rush into corneal transplantation. And actually medical therapy for all forms of keratitis, even for fungal, acanthamoeba, bacterial, viral, have improved dramatically. So uh, medical cure rates have risen. There are new options and tools for the management and diagnosis of these conditions. Um, so I think that uh, to try medical therapy and to try alternative medical therapy before we move into surgical uh, procedures is always best. So this is the first question on our poll. And uh, the question is, what are the most common causative organisms requiring therapeutic keratoplasty? All right, so this is a little bit of a tricky question. Um, uh, most of you uh, answered fungal keratitis. Uh, and then second to that was bacterial keratitis. So actually, um, if we look at the total percentage or the total number of grafts being performed, the most common indication will be bacterial keratitis with 31%. And that's actually because bacterial keratitis is much more common than the other forms of keratitis. But if we look at the rate in all bacterial keratitis and all fungal keratitis. So obviously more, fun more fungal keratitis might require uh, transplantation in percentage. So we have 31% for bacterial keratitis, uh, um, mainly being pseudomonas uh, because of the virulence and quark negative staph. Uh, secondly, we have fungal keratitis with, with aspergillus being the uh, highest, um, the highest organism requiring keratoplasty. Uh, mixed, uh, mixed ulcers, bacterial and fungal, are 6.9%. Uh, 
viral are 5.3 and acanthamoeba is 1.6. And I think this just relates with the rarity of the acanthamoeba infection, not necessarily that uh, patients with acanthamoeba rarely require grafts. Non-invasive surgical treatments are to be thought. So conjunctival flap, although that is a surgical treatment, in essence, it's a not penetrating treatment, and that could be considered in some cases, tersorophies, collagen cross-linking. Um, you know, there are even uh, studies showing uh, argon laser trying to uh, break up the biofilm of the ulcers to let the um, antibiotics uh, or the antimicrobials penetrate better, and cyanoacrylate glue and those that uh, may progress to perforation. But uh, always remember that bacterial infections can still uh, progress under glue. And uh, in, a, in a study performed uh, by Sharma et al. in India, uh, they found that out of 506 eyes, actually close to 90%, uh, they, they had close to 90% success in restoration of tectonic integrity when ulcers perforated. So let's talk a little bit about therapeutic keratoplasty in bacterial infections. So like I said before, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is probably the, um, uh, the organism most likely, uh, most likely um, associated with the need of a, a keratoplasty. Uh, it may produce collagenase with corneal, uh, rapid corneal thinning and can progress to perforation in 24 to 48 hours. So, Perhaps it perforates, it doesn't necessarily mean that we cannot get this infection under control medically uh, by eradicating pseudomonas because we do have antibiotics that can treat, her, treat it well. It's just that it, 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 um, the cornea thins and melts so quickly that uh, sometimes we just don't get in there in time. And then the other one is crystalline infectious keratitis that can be associated to candida or alpha hemolytic strep. And in fact, 50% of these uh, types of keratitis health medical treatment. And the reason is it's so deep in this trauma that it's hard to get to it. In combination with medical therapy, the cure rate of, in, of infection for bacterial infections reaches 90 to 100%, which is very good. How, how to decide what graft to do, which technique? Should we do a lamellar or should we do a penetrating graft? So in this study, uh, published in ophthalmology in 2009, we saw 126 eyes undergoing therapeutic keratoplasty. There were 26 therapeutic DALCs versus 100 therapeutic PKPs. We saw that the recurrence in the DALC group was slightly higher at 15.3 compared to 12% in the penetrating keratoplasty group. And um, we saw that nine out of the 12 uh, therapeutic PKPs actually required evisceration. Uh, the infection was that bad. Uh, of the therapeutic dogs, uh, we saw that they had better graft survival and better vision overall. So slightly higher recurrence, but overall long-term outcomes with the, with the dogs. So if the infection is not as deep, perhaps this is the way to go. Fungal keratitis. What are the things to consider when we're thinking about uh, the need of a therapeutic keratoplasty? Well, think that perforation is common in these ulcers in up to 50% of cases. Um, we're gonna think about penetrating keratoplasty or, or a keratoplasty when there's lack of response to medical treatment. Uh, we do for sure want to do very intensive antifungal therapy prior to, uh, to penetrating keratoplasty because these will help stabilize the cornea and will improve the uh, long-term prognosis. Remember, fungal elements can actually penetrate through decimase membrane. So I think that in fungal keratitis, one would opt more towards a therapeutic keratoplasty than a, a lamellar keratoplasty because there might be some higher recurrence in lamellar grafts. Um, Pollack showed that PKP was actually far superior than lamellar keratoplasty. There is another large Chinese study that looked at 604 therapeutic PKs uh, or keratoplasties for all causative organisms, they obtained 95% globe preservation, but they had a recurrence of 3.5% in penetrating grafts and higher recurrence, 7.3%, almost double for lamellar grafts. So think that therapeutic keratoplasty is not always curative. So the organism may come back, the infection may recur, 
In fact, fungal keratitis can have a recurrence rate in some studies. You know, the one that we looked at before um, had a lower recurrence rate, but the one uh, from Donald Tanat from Singapore showed a 47% or higher recurrence rate. Uh, this looked at 92 consecutive graphs, 15% experienced recurrences. I mean, 15 of the eyes experienced recurrences, 11 out of those 15 were fungal infections and most went on to evisceration. So if the fungus uh, recurs in the graft, that's usually not a good sign. Risk factors of recurrence were scleral extension and perforation. So this is our second poll question, which is not a predictor of need of therapeutic keratoplasty in severe fungal keratitis. Great, so I think most of you chose visual acuity and that's absolutely right. If we go to the next slide, uh, I think this is an important study. It was just published in JAMA in, two, um, in 2017. It was also uh, coming out from the Singapore registry. And um, what it basically showed, they, you know, they defined high risk features at baseline uh, as an infiltrate that was um, bigger than 6.6 .6 millimeters that it was involving the posterior one third of the stroma and that had a hypopion. So those were considered high risk features for uh, perforation or for, or for the need of therapeutic keratoplasty. When they did the multivariate analysis on patients with, um, uh, on, on patients with, low, with, um, uh, with fungal keratitis, what they found was that the depth of the infiltrate the size of the infiltrate and the presence of the hypopion, all of that was statistically significantly associated with uh, the need of a therapeutic keratoplasty or progression to perforation. However, visual acuity and the other, um, the other factor that they looked at was agricultural occupation, they did not find to be related. Um, so the, the, uh, the, these, you know, all of these patients came out from the Mikata ulcer treatment trial too. And, um, and so high risk patients were considered again, you know, those with a larger infiltrate, more than six millimeters, posterior involvement and hypopion. And the low risk, uh, low risk uh, patients were those, you know, all of the other patients in this same trial that did not have this characteristics. So remember infiltrate depth, uh, infiltrate size and hypopion uh, high risk features. Okay, let's talk about, continue to talk about therapeutic grafting in fungal keratitis. Um, what about postoperative management? I think uh, somebody from the audience, one of the questions was, um, you know, when do we use corticosteroids? And I would say caution when we're talking about fungal keratitis, it is better to withhold uh, because it is a risk factor for recurrence in the, uh, in the graft. Um, there are some small series looking at cyclosporin A instead, um, and they have showed safety, but again, this is a small number of patients, and it appears that cyclosporin might be suppressive um, on fungal growth, so perhaps this could be an alternative to corticosteroids uh, to try to preserve the graft and at the same time do not impair you know, the treatment of residual infection. This is just a case of mine. This is a 58 year old uh, male with severe, very severe facial and thermal burn. Uh, he had a Boston type one keratoprosthesis in the right eye about seven years ago. And he has significant exposure from you know, cicatricial extropion. His vision is about 20 to 100 due to glaucoma and some uh, macular edema and this is his baseline. So he underwent a caper and then he comes back one day looking like this and you can see um, all this, you know, pigmented stuff um, on the cornea. Um, and this is a zoomed uh, photograph and you can see how it's, it's surrounded the cornea and he has a contact lens over. So basically, uh, once we, we, we needed to do a therapeutic keratoplasty because uh, the uh, infection had gone eaten, basically eaten through the cornea. And you can see at high power, um, this is a PAS stain section show is showing a mass of fungal organisms. Um, in a medium power, you can see the perforation and you can see the fungal organisms. So we replaced it with another uh, keratoplasty and the culture show Exophiella feromuriformis. Uh, we treated him with a course of oral voriconazole, topical amphotericin B. Uh, we obviously stopped steroids 
and he's six months out and with no recurrences and the vision uh, improved. So think, things to think about when you're dealing with an infection within a prosthetic device is that sometimes uh, clearing the, uh, the organisms around a prosthetic device might be more difficult. There might be biofilm forming uh, over the surface of these devices that it may be difficult for antibiotics or antifungals to get uh, to get uh, to break. Uh, so consider therapeutic keratoplasty earlier in the course of the disease than you probably would on a patient that doesn't have a prosthetic device. And perhaps, you know, in this case, we've replaced it with another Capro, but perhaps sometimes when, when you're not sure you can control the infection, it might be better to replace it just with a regular cornea, knowing that it will, it will fail, and then go back to the uh, Capro later on once you are 100% sure the infection is controlled. And also, you have to consider that, you know, um, because of the surface that the, the plastic and the keratoprosthesis occupies on the surface of the cornea, then the penetration of the, uh, of the antimicrobials may not be optimal. What about acanthamoeba keratitis? Well, the efficacy of the medical treatment for acanthamoeba keratitis uh, was looked at in a, a study published in Cornea in 2014. They looked at 116 patients and they saw that 66% were successfully treated medically, but 33% actually required keratoplasty for the treatment. Fikir et al. showed that uh, there's poor graft survival in patients with acanthamoeba keratitis, that more than 50% had recurrence in the graft, and other short series some, uh, had somewhat better outcomes than the ones showed in this study. Most common complications after therapeutic keratoplasty in patients with acanthamoeba uh, is glaucoma, mitriatic pupil, and graft failure in about 50%, like we said before. Um, so optical keratoplasty is always better. If we can wait, if we can control the infection medically, this will always be the better outcome. So this is another study on acanthamoeba keratitis. They looked at 22 eyes. 20% had a therapeutic PKP. Two had a lamellar keratoplasty. Uh, versus nine eyes with an optical penetrating keratoplasty. We saw that the recurrences were 41% in the therapeutic keratoplasty, but interestingly, it was 22% of recurrence in the optical keratoplasty. So what we thought that perhaps the infection was controlled, was eradicated, we did the optical keratoplasty, and still in acanthamoeba that we saw recurrences up to 22%. So repeat grafts, 55% of therapeutic keratoplasties needed to be repeated and only 11% of the optical keratoplasties needed to be repeated. So we look at graft survival at, at one year, uh, always the optical is better. When we go out to 10 years, again, you know, about double the success rate for the optical uh, keratoplasty compared to the therapeutic one. And of course, this is to be expected. Some other studies on penetrating keratoplasty in acanthamoeba. There is uh, this study out of Dallas that looked at 13 eyes. They saw that the best corrected visual acuity was 2015 uh, to 2040 in 12 out of 13 eyes. It's actually excellent outcomes. Uh, one patient had light perception secondary to glaucoma, and all 12 remained clear with a median follow-up of 23 months. Another study, a little larger, 32 eyes out of Brazil, uh, these, this study involved mainly advanced disease with acanthamoeba. They saw that 55% of crafts were clear at one year. They had two recurrences, and they had a very high rate of glaucoma, which they identified as the primary risk factor for graft failure. So this is another uh, case I wanted to share with you. This is a 68-year-old man with a history of keratoconus and uh, rigid gas permeable uh, contact lens wear. He reports when we see him a two-month history of discomfort and non-healing epithelial defect. He had been treated for HSV keratitis, for neurotrophic ulcer, including amniotic membrane transplantation. And I apologize for the blurriness of the photograph because this was actually taken with the patient's phone. Uh, but he looked like this when he came in. It was kind of a diffuse, you know, infiltrate um, uh, of the whole cornea. Uh, this was a confocal mic uh, microscopy and you can see uh, it is actually full, full of uh, amoeba cysts. So he was started on Brolin, 
propamidine and by one eye, PHMB, every hour. And we also started him on oral voriconazole. And the reason we started him on oral voriconazole is, I don't know if you can appreciate in this photograph, but you can see how the limbus looks a little bit heaped up. And we had the question whether there was actually some limbo, uh, limbo extension of the infection. Unfortunately, he develops very difficult to control glaucoma. You know, every, every complication that we talked about before, uh, you're going to see in this patient, very difficult to control glaucoma, a fixed and amidriatic pupil, rapidly progressive dense cataract, which these, all these might be side effects also from the topical, uh, topical agents that we're using. A shallow peripheral chamber with development of peripheral anterior synechiae. Um, the epithelial defect continues to enlarge, the corneal thins, he has an impending perforation. We try to do some amniotic membrane packing, but he returns with pain, a flat chamber, a high IOP, and a perforation. We take him to the operating room. We performed a 10.5 millimeter PKP, almost limbus to limbus. We do a uh, peripheral iridotomy. We take out the cataract. Uh, we place an asulcus IOL. We put an amet valve all at the same time. Um, this is the corneal button that we removed at the time, and you can see the load of organisms in the cyst is just massive. Uh, and actually, the amoeba went all the way up to the margins of the trephination, so we know we have residual disease. He returns two days later with an IOP of 50. He has pain. Uh, the IOL is touching the graft, uh, very flat chamber. So we think that he has aqueous misdirection. We take him to the operating room. We do a pars a vitrectomy with a posterior capsulotomy and another peripheral iridotomy. And uh, he does well after that, but we had to do add one month course of multifacin. This is a new drug. Um, I think there are some studies coming out, which this patient is actually a part of, uh, looking at you know, uh, refractive cases about anthamoeba cratitis using this drug. He used this for two months. Plus, uh, the, I'm sorry, he used this for one month plus a, a two month course of top, topical pH and B. And the graft has been clear so far uh, with no recurrences. So, this was an extreme case, very advanced case of acanthamoeba keratitis with a good outcome. Now, this is only six months after we did this graft. What would be his one year, five year, 10 year survival? Probably not great. Optical keratoplasty for acanthamoeba keratitis. This is another case. He's a truck driver. Um, he presents with classic acanthamoeba signs. Um, he responds well to medical treatment. We do an optical keratoplasty. And despite the fact that he has some neovascularization around, um, around the graft, he did very well. Uh, no rejection, no recurrence for over five years. Uh, therapeutic keratoplasty in herpetic keratitis. So HSV is most commonly performed. Uh, keratoplasty in HSV is actually most commonly performed for optical purposes. I would, I would say the vast majority will be for optical purposes. But there are some cases of active stromal disease that have significant ulceration or perforation and maybe removing the antigenic material causing repeat immunologic episodes might be uh, worthwhile. It does require oral acyclovir therapy and topical steroids. Wang et al. published 22 cases of lamellar keratoplasty in active disease, uh, and he had one graft rejection and four recurrences. Herpes zoster, the prognosis, as you all know, is generally worse than, the one, than that for uh, um, herpes simplex virus. Uh, there's more severe anesthesia and usually requires adjunctive tertiary and amniotic membrane transplantation to get the transplant to heal and epithelialize. This is a case of mine. This is another K-Pro um, that developed very severe HSV keratitis. And um, the reason why I, uh, I realized this was not just a melt in the cornea, but, but, uh, but HSV, as you can see that they infiltrate, not doesn't just involve the donor cornea, but also the host cornea. She actually had severe vitritis related to HSV keratitis. She responded very well to oral, um, oral acyclovir and she went back to uh, baseline. I think, you know, after uh, almost thinking we were gonna have to do a therapeutic keratoplasty in her, medical therapy was eventually successful and she ended up with a very thin cornea that held and we didn't have to replace it. 
What about preoperative planning for therapeutic chloroplasty? Let's evaluate. How do we evaluate the patient? Well, uh, make sure you record the size and the depth of the corneal infiltration, uh, the presence of limbal involvement to help you, you know, decide how you're going to place that uh, chloroplasty. Uh, whether there's corneal perforation or not, whether there's associated endophthalmitis or glaucoma, and you need to do something about that during the surgery. Try to do a dilated fundus examination. If there's no view, make sure you do an ultrasonography to rule out the presence of vitritis. Systemic and topical antimicrobial treatment. Um, if the causative diagnosis is not established, you want to uh, continue broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy or a combination therapy. Um, Hopefully, you know, the tissue, the, the pathology tissue that you'll recover from the keratoplasty, um, if you send it for culture and you send it for, uh, for pathology, perhaps PCR, uh, you might be able now to identify the organism and direct your treatment a little bit more accurately. Perioperative treatment, intravenous mannitol to decrease intraoperative complications due to positive vitreous pressure that you may have in these patients uh, might be helpful. Uh, topical, subconjunctival, or intrastromal administration of antivascular endothelial growth factor agents, if there's a lot of neovascularization, might be useful. But also, you may decide to inject with antimicrobials uh, into the anterior chamber, into the residual stroma, if you see that you're leaving any residual disease. And this might help uh, control the infection. If you see that there's associated vitritis, perhaps you'll decide to do intravitreal injections. What anesthesia to use? General anesthesia is preferred if the, on a perforated globe as a rule of thumb, that's always the case. But peribulbar injection is a viable option in cases without perforation. It is really important to try to have, um, you know, to, have, to ha try to have a soft eye that is not moving and where the anesthesia is well achieved. However, there might be patients that are not candidates for general anesthesia. And Vito et al. published topical anesthesia in eight cooperative patients with perforated corneal ulcers and associated com systemic comorbidities. So while I don't advise this approach, it can be done in extreme cases. What about the donor material? What kind of tissue should we order or should we, should we take? Um, well, you want good quality donor tissue. Uh, a healthy donor endothelium will help you maintain a clear graft despite the associated inflammation and the intraocular pressure. So it will give you better chances of success. And an intact epithelium, I think this is important because it minimizes the risk of graft reinfection. So it's not that often that we get corneas where, with intact epithelium, but if you have one, I think that this would be better. What if you don't have readily available fresh tissue? We could use non-optical grade cryopreserved corneal tissue. These are corneas that are devoid of live cells. Um, the chances of an allograft rejection are minimal because their an antigens are minimized by the absence of cells, so there's no need for steroid use. Uh, once the infection is resolved, then you can go in and do a smaller, di a smaller diameter optical keratoplasty and, um, and rehabilitate the patient visually. So again, corneal tissue is scarce is in many parts of the world. Uh, there's a limited supply of transplantable corneas for Dalcor PKP. So they use, there's a study uh, published in cornea in 2006 that looked at the use of preserved tissue. They used 22 grafts, glitteral preserved. They used uh, 16 of the 22 grafts were for fungal infections. Complications that they found were glaucoma, 50%, wound leakage, 32%, recurrence, 68%, enucleation or evisceration, uh, or eyes going to enucleation or evisceration, 9 out of 22, so 40%, so a, a, a high number. And the final visual acuity, uh, uh, or the 13 out of 22 eyes, was 162 LP. <clears throat> sequential, what about if we do sequential cryopreserved tissue versus, uh, versus optical grade tissue? So 10 eyes received cryopreserved tissue followed shortly in 17 days by an optical grade tissue. 22 eyes, which received optical grade tissue alone. The therapeutic success was 10 out of 10 of the sequential grafts were successful, and 13 out of 22 of the optical grade tissue um, were successful. In one-year survival, we saw 72 or 73% of the sequential 
uh, versus 53.8% of the primary optical. So basically we're using this cryopreserved tissue when, uh, when we have all this high inflammation, we're giving all these drops that can uh, be somewhat toxic. And then once the infection is resolved, shortly after we, uh, we go to um, fresh cornea and then that fresh cornea will have much higher rate of success than if we did it from the get-go. This is what this study, the bottom line of this study, which was done out of the Singapore group. What about the surgical technique and uh, some intra-op considerations? So think about support, maybe a ring or whatever form of scleral support you like for your keratoplasties might be important. Avoid pressure on the globe in cases of perforation. Uh, and, and, these, uh, and, and for this reason, think about what kind of speculum you're gonna use. Sometimes the Lieberman can uh, put some pressure on the globe. Maybe you want to use a shots or a jaffe or uh, a different type of uh, speculum to retract the eyelids, uh, perhaps even traction sutures. Uh, remove all infected tissue. As, as much as you can, try to remove all of the infected tissue, leaving about one millimeter rim of healthy tissue if possible. Even if you have to do an eccentric or large graft, just try to remember that you're getting in there uh, on a hot eye to control the, the infection. Careful trephination. Glue sometimes can be useful if you have a perforation to try to pressurize the globe and, uh, and obtain a better trephination. But you can also use handheld tree finds or you can freehand it sometimes. Take cultures, especially if you don't know what you're treating. But even if you do, it never hurts to take cultures. Send tissue for pathology and microbiology. And consider, like we talked before, intrastromal, subconjunctival, or intravitreal injections as needed. Remember that less is more. So if, if you don't see the crystalline lens affected, leave it. It will be a barrier between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. Irrigate the anterior chamber with BSS, inspect the iris for infect, infectious foci, address risk factors for perforation, and consider a peripheral iridotomy. Why? Because um, this is a hot eye, and uh, it is possible that you're gonna have a lot of inflammation after these transplants, so you may have uh, a uh, scenicked pupil that could cause secondary angle closure. And if you have a uh, peripheral iridotomy in place, this is usually helpful to try to do a laser iridotomy later on when you don't have a very good view on a hazy graft and an inflamed anterior chamber can be difficult. This is a case of a large dia diameter corneal scleral graft. This is one of those Hail Marys when you're trying to you know, control an infection that, um, that is very advanced and it's affecting not just the cornea, but also the sclera. So in this case, we, we did a, a, almost like an, a complete anterior segment uh, transplant or, or you know, corneal scleral transplant in an advanced case of acanthamoeba keratitis. And she's two years out with 20-30 visual acuity doing very well. This is another case. It's a 45-year-old truck driver. He has fusarium corneal ulcer that's not responding to medical treatment. I uh, use natamycin and oral fl uh, fluconazole with signs of possible intraocular in invasion, as you can see in the photograph, that endothelial, large endothelial plaque. So what is the next step in management? All right, so uh, it's kind of close, but I think most of you chose therapeutic keratoplasty. So he's already on an oral antifungal, so we could add a different one. Uh, collagen cross-linking, you know, the results are kind of mixed as to the success for that. And intrastromal injection of amphotericin B, uh, that could also be an option, but if we already see that it's going into the anterior chamber, perhaps something more aggressive needs to be done. And this is what we decided to do, a therapeutic keratoplasty. But as you can see, the uh, aspergillus um, recurred, uh, you know, in the periphery of the graft, uh, on the area of the limbus and part of the sclera what to do now. And what we did was, again, another Hail Mary, uh, basically to try to preserve the eye. And we did this um, uh, almost like a keratolimbal transplant or allograft, uh, where we took part of the sclera and part of the cornea, and we, we removed all that infected tissue, and we placed that over there. Uh, and then we advanced the conjunctiva uh, over that area. Um, and you know, after a few months of continuous me continued medical treatment, he eventually healed. So yeah, he doesn't see well out of this eye, but he was able to 
keep the eye and we save the eye and perhaps later on we can do some uh, form of visual rehabilitation he's you know with this densely vascularized cornea and failed graft he's not you know failed limbus he's not a candidate for a traditional keratoplasty but perhaps a penetrating keratop uh, but perhaps a, a keratoprosthesis might be an option for him what is the prognosis long-term graft survival what is the prognosis when in, in in general, when we do therapeutic keratoplasty uh, for infectious diseases, the long-term graft survival is poor. Singapore Cornell Transplant Study looked at 901 eyes, and 8.1 of all of those eyes were classified as therapeutic. And they showed that when we looked at optical keratoplasty, the success rate, again, was double that of the therapeutic keratoplasty at every single point censored, including one, three, five, and 10 years. So what are the most significant risk factors for graft failure after therapeutic keratoplasty in infectious keratitis? So again, one could say that all of these are causes, are, are risk factors for graft failure, but what do you think are the most significant? And the, the correct answer for, uh, for this question is actually based on a study. So it doesn't mean that it's the absolute truth. Um, so most of you, uh, chose a presence of corneal inflammation, others uh, neovascularization, persistent glaucoma, and the presence of perforation. So all of you thought of um, some of them. So when we looked at the, the study, again, we're looking at the Singapore study. Um, when they looked at the risk factors for graft failure, they found that to corneal perforation, number one, and the presence of ocular inflammation are the most significant risk factors for graft failure. And we all know that corneal neovascularization uh, means a high risk graft and that glaucoma and, and cornea and corneal grafts don't get along very well. So by all means, they are all risk factors as you can see by, uh, by the kaplan meier curves where the, um, you know, the presence of glaucoma has less survival, the presence of perforation has less survival, uh, the vascularization and the inflammation. But of all of them, um, the, those two were the most associated. So key points of everything that we've talked about today. Um, most common indication is still bacterial infection just because it's the most common infection. But the rate of fungal and acanthamoeba keratitis requiring grafting is approximately 50%. Success rates of surgical therapies are best for bacterial corneal infections and worst for fungal infections. Unresponsive corneal infections, impending perforations and perforations are the usual indications for surgical intervention. Tissue is scars and cryopreserved tissue followed by an optical keratoplasty is a good option. Long-term graft survival is poor, better when performed for optical indications. So with all those uh, take home messages, um, I thank you for listening. Uh, my email is here if uh, you ever need to reach out for anything, but we can answer questions if you have any. First question says, um, what is the cause of keratitis? I'm not exactly sure I understand this question. Perhaps the, uh, whoever wrote it could clarify. Um, the second question, in which type of infectious keratitis, penetrating keratoplasty is more successful? And the answer is in bacterial keratitis. Um, how under glue bacterial keratitis may increase. So uh, we use the glue to, to perhaps, you know, uh, prevent a perforation or to treat a small perforation, but it doesn't necessarily treat the infection. And under the glue where the uh, antibiotic might, might not be penetrating, the uh, infection may progress. That's what I meant when I mentioned that. What methods of suturing, interrupted or running? I would say always uh, interrupted because um, these, you know, there's inflammation, there's going to be wound healing, and, there, um, and, and the sutures may loosen much sooner than on a regular graft. So having interrupted sutures will allow you to selectively, you know, remove some of them uh, versus just the running suture. Uh, perhaps where you're dealing with vascularization and things like that, uh, you know, I think an interrupted suture may allow you uh, to revise the wound if you have to in some areas. I think that is the better technique for these, uh, these circumstances. 
for corneal scleral grafts, is the scleral portion partial thickness? Yes. So if you can thin it out, uh, that's usually better. You can, you know, remove, do, do a spirectomy on the host, uh, remove, you know, uh, partial sclera, and then try to thin out the donor sclera, and then uh, you can uh, suture them together. And I think that works best, almost like you're shelving them. Do prophylactic uh, peripheral iridotomy sometimes increase infection? Um, no, I don't think so. What I uh, said, what I mentioned by this is whenever I'm doing a penetrating keratoplasty on an eye that's inflamed, that's actively infected, I do a peripheral iridotomy because I will expect that there will be inflammation, perhaps fibrin um, in the anterior chamber in the immediate postoperative period. And having this uh, peripheral iridotomy uh, decreases the chance of having, um, you know, uh, angle closure and pupillary block after surgery. Uh, my question, how long we should wait before deciding for therapeutic keratoplasty? I think this is a great question because timing is everything. Um, you know, you don't wanna do it too soon. You want to allow the um, antimicrobials to work because like we said, if we can control an infection medically, that's always better. But if you wait too long, you may have lose, lost that window of opportunity where the uh, keratoplasty could have taken care of the situation by removing most uh, or all of the infection. And then if you let it advance to sclera or you know, uh, go into endophthalmitis and perhaps it's too late and the success won't, won't be as good. Uh, so timing is everything. So if you have an infection where you tried the antimicrobials, didn't work, you switch to whatever alternative there are, and it's still not working and you're seeing it progressing or you're starting to see uh, you know, the potential for uh, extracorneal extension, then by all means, I think that's the time to go ahead and do the keratoplasty. The next question is, what if in the few days post-therapeutic keratoplasty you have a suture infiltrate? Would you remove the suture with a risk of leaking? Um, the answer is yes, I think I would remove the suture. Uh, if I have to replace the suture, then you can replace the suture. That's why I think interrupted sutures are much better because oftentimes you can remove just one suture and not have a leak. <clears throat> Next question, where do you obtain pH and B and Broling from? Uh, is it compounded? Um, yes, our, 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 our pharmacy uh, compounds the pH and B and the Broling we obtain from Europe. Um, next question, how does the outcome of collagen cross-linking compare to therapeutic PK in bacterial keratitis? Um, I don't think I have a, a evidence-based um, answer to this question. I don't think there are studies com uh, comparing penetrating keratoplasty to cross-linking directly. Um, I do think that the uh, studies uh, done for cross-linking and advanced bacterial keratitis are um, um, you know, some of our are smaller, you know, smaller number of patients. Uh, the other thing is, I think that collagen cross-linking perhaps in the future might have a bigger impact in early ulcers than it does in advanced ulcers, uh, where penetrating keratoplasty is always more for advanced ulcers. The exact role of collagen cross-linking in infectious keratitis, I think that's yet to be determined. Uh, we don't know exactly what their role is. Um, there's uh, the group up out from Sweden that's advocating the use of collagen cross-linking for as the initial treatment for ulcers. For example, you know, for patients that have poor access uh, to medical therapy uh, or to to seeing a doctor, then they can they come in. Perhaps they traveled, you know, six hours to see the doctor. They have a corneal ulcer. So could we do collagen cross-linking as a sole treatment for the small ulcer and take care of that without the patient having to use antibiotics or come back for frequent follow-up? This is a, a hypothesis that they're working on. Uh, there are some studies like I talked about where they use these for advanced non-responsive ulcers and, some, and in some of them it works somewhat and some of them doesn't. When do you suspect that hypopion is infected uh, rather than a sterile one? This is a good question. 
And uh, sometimes it is difficult to determine whether the infection has, has progressed into the anterior chamber or not. I think that um, for the most part, if we're talking about a pseudomonas bacterial ulcer, uh, usually the hypopion tends to be <clears throat> sterile. When we're looking at a, at a fungal ulcer, uh, it's more commonly that you'll see these endothelial plaques that denote uh, you know, intra, intracameral um, intracamel infection or extension of the infection. So I think that the organism is usually, you know, more suspicious when we're talking about, um, about parasites or fungal, that the hypopion is actually uh, infectious rather than sterile. But ultimately, you know, you never know for sure unless you sample the anterior chamber. Uh, next question. Is it possible to try amniotic mem membrane transplant first for impending perforation before considering therapeutic keratoplasty? And I think the answer is, is yes. As, as you saw in one of uh, the, the advanced acanthamoeba patients, that's what we tried, the amniotic membrane packing uh, to avoid the perforation and see if we can get the epithelium to heal. Uh, that didn't work and ultimately we needed to go to therapeutic keratoplasty. So as long as we we understand, the patient understands that there might be another surgery soon. If this doesn't work, uh, it, it can be tried. So some of the questions we went through that, that were sent ahead of the webinar, we're just gonna go through now. Uh, the first one is uh, advice on timing of PKP when culture positive infection with perforation. I think once it's perforated, my, um, uh, my you know, my gut would be just to go right away. Uh, once the patient is perforated, then I would want to do the PKP right away, you know, the same day if possible. Can this be done for patients with a hypopion ulcer? The answer is yes. Uh, I, will, I would do a penetrating keratoplasty. I would wash the anterior chamber, remove, you know, remove the hypopion, wash with BSS, and perhaps, you know, inject intracamel antibiotics if needed. <clears throat> Uh, so how to prevent the infectious keratitis? That's a, a difficult one. I think this one depends on, uh, on the epidemiology of each country and what the causative, most common causative organisms are and you know, what kind of you know, uh, public health measures can be taken to prevent infectious keratitis. Um, you know, in, in some cases, for example, here in the U.S., there were big uh, break, uh, breakouts of infection with fusarium, for example, secondary to contact lens solutions. Uh, so, you know, having a stricter, um, a stricter uh, organism, you know, to approve uh, these type of solutions for contact lenses might be a good idea. Uh, but I think it's different for each country. The uh, next question is, in case the graft gets reinfected with the same organism, when would you decide to take up for re-PK? So again, I mean, the graft may get reinfected and in this infection, we might be able to manage medically, but I think I would have a low threshold to go back and repeat the graft if the infection continues to, uh, to be not controlled. Is there any contraindication in infectious keratitis? I assume that this is, is there any contraindication to keratoplasty in infectious keratitis? And I would say, no. I mean, you have an infection that is not controlled. So um, you want to, uh, you know, you, you want to try to uh, control it. And the alternative will be that the patient loses the eye because the infection continues to progress. Um, so I would say no. If we're talking about an optical uh, keratoplasty, uh, you know, the, the traditional teaching is that a cornea that has poor corneal sensation is a poor candidate for a penetrating keratoplasty. A cornea that has, um, you know, high degree of vascularization, that, that, like that patient that I showed you after the fusarium, you know, those are very high risk for penetrating keratoplasty. And perhaps it is relatively contraindicated because we know that they will do very poorly. And perhaps we need to look at other options to rehabilitate them, like an artificial cornea. Um, is there any update treatment of infectious keratitis? I think there's plenty. Uh, I think more than I can cover just today in this webinar. 
Uh, but there are new medications. We talked a little bit about multifacin for acanthamy refractive acanthamoeba cases. Um, you know, there's the mycotic ulcer trial that looked at the uh, oral voriconazole, showing that uh, it is not necessarily effective for fungal keratitis and perhaps doesn't need to be used. Uh, that the most effective for um, aspergillus is actually natamycin. So all of this you can find uh, in some of the my mycotic ulcer trials. I think that's, that's a good review for the treatment of fungal keratitis. Uh, there's also, uh, um, you know, uh, another study, again, multicenter, which looked at the use of steroids in bacterial ulcers. I think that's uh, uh, also something nice to look where they found that uh, it is, the use of steroids is actually contraindicated in nocardia, and it might be helpful in large central ulcers, but it has no difference in the final outcome in the rest of the ulcer, bacterial ulcers. New treatments for uh, keratoplasty rejection. Uh, I mean, the traditional treatment is steroids. It's, what, it's what's going to act faster. Um, you can try to use, uh, you know, a, 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 a more potent steroids, like um, uh, here in the United States, we use Duracell, it's difludronamide, um, and you can use that. Uh, and then alternative, you can use cyclosporin to prevent rejection, and not necessarily to treat it. Uh, topical uh, cyclosporin 1%. And we have been used for uh, uh, rejections that are refractive to topical steroids, which have used tacrolimus. 0.3% uh, topically uh, in drops compounded by our pharmacy, and we've had some success with that. So now for all of my um, high-risk transplants, I may put them on tacrolimus together with a um, with, a, with a steroid. It's also helpful to have something like cyclosporin or tacrolimus on board, even if topically, because um, it, it may help to reduce the dose of steroids that we need to use and reduce the incidence of ocular hypertension and secondary glaucoma. Next question, should anterior OCT per, be performed previously on all penetrating keratoplasties under, uh, undergoing patient to minimize high order aberrations effect after surgery. Um, I think that when we're talking about a penetrating keratoplasty for infectious keratitis, not necessarily. Uh, I, I don't think I performed OCT unless I want to see something on the anterior segment to help me with surgery, but not necessarily for higher order aberrations. What does PANA signify in a healing stage? I mean, vessels going into a wound are, are usually I would a sign that, they, that there's a lot of wound healing going on. Now, granted, we don't want you know, vessels on our corneas. So uh, when we're starting to see um, you know, neovascularization, perhaps we can consider some anti-VEGF therapy, either topical drops or subconjunctival injections or an increase the dose of steroids. So what is the modern treatment of fungal keratitis? I'm not sure how to answer that. I think that, um, you know, perhaps performing PCR for, um, for early diagnosis of the causative or agent is, uh, is, is, is the way to go. And, and then, you know, using the newer antifungal agents like um, the azoles, like bosaconazole, um, and um, caspafungin is another antifungal that we've been using. And like I said, um, you know, uh, just early diagnosis, I think that's key. What is the most common cause of keratitis? I think that's bacterial keratitis all around the world. Um, when and how to decide to do the therapeutic keratoplasty? I think we went over this. Uh, and I think it's when the, ulcer is, when the ulcer is perforated or it has impending perforation, and there's a risk of uh, extracorneal extension uh, when, and when the uh, infection is progressing and not responding to medical treatment. When do you start topical steroids post keratoplasty for fungal keratitis? Any role of systemic steroids? I think caution, caution, caution when you're using topical steroids post fungal keratitis. I would prefer that, you know, that the um, that the, the, the graft fails and we have to repeat it if, if we have to because they're rejected. But I don't want, uh, you know, the infection to go under control because of the use of steroids. So I think I would be very judicious in the use of steroids after fungal keratitis. 
And the last one, I think we already talked about this. When should we go for therapeutic keroplasty in cases of fungal keratitis? And I think is, you know, think about it early because we already know that 50% will need penetrating keroplasty. So if you feel this ulcer is not going anywhere and it's enlarging, you know, get, get in sooner before the, the infection gets too large and then you're not able to remove it with a keratoplasty. Um, I think that's all of the questions. I see one more question here in the Q&A of the attendees. That, um, it says, in limbus to limbus therapeutic keratoplasty, is there a risk of epithelial downgrowth? If yes, how to prevent it? <clears throat> I think that, um, I mean, there could be a risk. I haven't, you know, particularly encountered this complication very commonly after large grafts, uh, but I think having a, a good wound, you know, good a post wound um, with no leakage, with no gaping or anything like that is key. Uh, sometimes this is difficult in an active infection because you may be suturing on tissue that is not that healthy. But I think um, uh, trying to have a, a, a watertight wound is important. <clears throat>